So I think uh, we're five minutes after, so I think we'll get started. Um, and if others show up online or, or uh, in person, we'll just try and catch them up. So uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this day and for a chance to gather around uh, this study. And uh, today, uh, specifically to look at uh, Jesus and, and what we say about him. We ask your blessings on our time together. May your spirit inspire us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, I'm going to start by asking if anyone has uh, any questions um, or comments out of last week that you didn't think of at the time or, or whatever. There's no, oh, here's Ann Nosbachen joining here. Um, if, I, I, I don't need there to be questions or, or whatever, just want to make sure that I uh, give you a chance to, um, to ask if you have something. So if there's no questions, what we're going to do is going to jump into the study for today. And that'll work. Okay, so uh, today uh, we're going to look at the second uh, article of the uh, of the creed. Good. Okay. No, I can't see. I don't see it all. Okay. Okay. okay so someone was. I think that was. Uh, I'm just muting. Okay. So uh, how we're going to do that is. Um, oh, now they jumped to there. That I didn't want. So I need to. Hmm. I jumped to the wrong spot. Jumped on me. Uh, we're getting there. There we go. That's what I want. Okay. So uh, what we're going to be looking at. Whoops, no, that's session five. We want session six. <laughs> uh, last week, uh, things went just fine here. It was a Thursday evening that I had no end of technical problems. It was, uh, it was goofy. Anyways, here we are. All right, so uh, you will hopefully remember this chart. So this is uh, showing the whole creed. Um, so you got the three different uh, articles or three different persons. Um, uh, number one, indicating God, the Father, God, the Creator. Number two, indicating God, the Son, uh, uh, God, the Christ. Um, and number three, indicating God, the Holy Spirit. And then we had at the top, mystery and expansive, meaning that those things that are uh, said uh, at that point in the creed are more about elements of mystery and expansiveness. And then uh, at the very bottom, at the sharp point of the triangle down uh, is the words revealed and singular, meaning that at that point we're talking about something uh, very, uh, like sort of the opposite of mysterious in terms of we can understand, at least in some level, we can understand what's happening here. Uh, it's revealed. Um, uh, to us, and it's not a mystery uh, in one sense, and uh, it's singular, meaning it's talking about a specific single person, single moment in time, single event. Uh, and then at the bottom, uh, we have a timeline that says, as we move from left to right, we're moving from past uh, into the future. So that, if you remember that, then what I can say is that what we're going to look at today is the second article okay the second article uh, and and most of our time is going to be spent it may be probably all of our time is going to be spent on that so 
this is the article, this is the part of the creed that talks about Jesus Christ, all right? So uh, it begins, and I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, right? So the question is, who is this Jesus Christ, right? Who is Jesus Christ? Um, that's, that's the starting point that we have to ask. And the first thing I want to point out, and this is particularly important to say to uh, students who don't know much about Christianity, is that Christ is not a name. So Christ isn't Jesus' last name. It's a title. So uh, how are we to know who this one is? Now, the name Jesus, um, or in Aramaic, it could be Yeshua, uh, which is related to the Hebrew name Joshua, right, was a common name. Like, it wasn't like he was the only Jesus around. There were other Jesuses around. So how did people know that they were referring to this specific Jesus and not Jesus over there? Uh, they w would have had to have designated him somehow. Um, and how do they designate him? And so we're going to talk for a moment about last names. So there are three types of last names. Uh, and this is in Western culture. This is what we're used to out of our uh, sort of European heritage um, and uh, in, other, in other regions too, they use similar stuff. But if you go, for example, to Asia, uh, the way they use names is different. So basically, we've got three types of last names. We've got relational names. And uh, an example of that would be Johnson, literally meaning John's son. So it's who uh, this person is related to. Oh, there is... Eric Johnson, Eric, the son of John. And in a small village, that would be probably sufficient to identify, you know, who you're talking about. Um, I have a relational last name, Hendrickson, right, which is Hendrick's son, right? At some point in the Scandinavian tradition, they stopped changing every generation. And, uh, and so, so there were a number of generations that were Hendrickson's. Um, so, so, for example, I didn't get to be called Leslieson, which is my dad's first name was Leslie, not Dean. He ended up going by Dean uh, most of his adult life. But anyways, or it could have been Deanson. Anyways, that hasn't been the way it's worked for uh, quite a while. Now, when we talk about Jesus, he is known by a relational name. That's one of the ways he's known. Uh, it would have been sent uh, probably this way in Hebrew, uh, Jesus ben Joseph, or the equivalent uh, in English would have been Josephson. Now, we have a few references that indicate that. So if you want to look up uh, any one of these, uh, you'll see where Jesus is referred to by this form of a last name. So take a moment and look those up. So uh, now, depending on your translation, it may read a little bit different. But uh, for example, I've got here Luke uh, 4.22, and this is what it says. Everyone was raving about Jesus. So impressed were they by the gracious words flowing from his lips. They said, this is Joseph's son, isn't it? So there's, you know, like they're trying to identify who is this person? Well, this is Joseph's son. So you could have said Jesus, Joseph's son, right? So that's that one. Uh, then, well, why don't we look at one more here? John 1, 45 says, um, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the Law and the Prophets, Jesus, Joseph's son from Nazareth. Okay, and that leads us to another possibility. But we'll get to that in a minute. Last names are also vocational. Vocational meaning they say uh, what the person does. And the most common last name in the English language is the name what? Smith. Smith. And that's short for blacksmith. So it meant uh, Fred the blacksmith. And in a village, again, 
you would typically just have one blacksmith. Uh, and so if you said Fred uh, Smith, everyone would know who that is, right? But can you come up with some examples, some other examples of vocational last names? Makers of the whiskey. <laughs> Ricky. Okay. Clay. So someone who works with clay. I'm assuming, right? Yeah. So, but that's, I, I'm assuming is what I mean. Like a clay maker or like a ceramic person or something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Cooper. Cooper. Yes. Cooper is one, but not too many people know what a Cooper do, did. But do you know what a Cooper did? Made barrels. Yes. Made barrels. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Fix ships too? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rose. Well, my, my first name was Kennedy, then it went to Potter, then it went to Miller. But both Potter and Miller were me. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So you've got, you've got an understanding of what vocational names are, right? And we've got lots of them floating around uh, in our culture. Jesus was also known as a vocational name, right? Jesus Carpenter. Right? And so here's a couple of examples, one from Mark and one from Matthew. So I'll uh, uh, look up the Mark one. You can look these up as well. Mark 6, 3. So Mark 6, 3, and this translation says, Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't he Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters with us here? Uh, so these are people from, uh, from Nazareth. Uh, Jesus has gone and spoken in the, the temple, in the synagogue there, and then people are asking this. So notice we have actually both sort of relational and vocational name there. Isn't this the carpenter's son? So you get the relational aspect, right? But then you also get, oh, son of Mary and, and stuff, right? So, so that's one. And then in Matthew uh, 13.55... You get, uh, you get this comment. Uh, isn't he the carpenter's son? Again, similar kind of idea, right? Now, in this case, they're calling him the son of the carpenter, but by tradition, uh, a son would have learned the trade of the, of the father. So, you know, would have been a fisher or would have been a carpenter. Now, carpenter is a little bit misleading because uh, the people in that region... Uh, for construction purposes, did not work that much with wood. There was not a lot of wood available. Uh, so they, uh, they worked more with stone if they were building a structure. Uh, so they would have been uh, you know, people who worked with stone, maybe add wood. So uh, probably a better uh, understanding of what Joseph did was he was a construction worker. That would be a better term. So whatever materials he used, uh, that's what he did. He went to places, and what we know um, uh, from archaeological records is that there was building going on. Romans were building uh, towns in the neighborhood of, of Nazareth. So chances are what would happen is Joseph would get up in the morning and walk five uh, kilometers to uh, where this uh, town was being built and would be involved in construction projects there. So that's quite likely what he did. So carpenter, we have a romantic image of Jesus working with wood. And there would have been some of that, but that wouldn't have been his primary, probably his primary uh, material that he worked with. Not that that matters, but just wanted to point that out. All right, the last kind of name that we are familiar with is locational names, meaning saying where a person is from. And uh, probably the best example of this is something like out of the, out of the Dutch people, if you see the, the word van, that means from. So Vincent van Gogh, right, is Vincent from the village of Go or Goth, however they pronounced it over there, right? Uh, so you have that. Uh, you, you would have, uh, there's other terms that would be similar, uh, you know, from s s such and such a place, right? Uh, yes, go ahead. Onerheim. Onerheim, meaning? Onar is, if you Google it, it's an island region. Yep. And Heim is home. So, so uh, the ho my home is in the island region. Of Onar. 
of Onar. My, okay, so, so we've got these. Uh, there are, uh, I sometimes think that uh, even like in our city here, we have the Hill family. And I wonder if originally it meant they were the family from the Hill, you know. And uh, so you've got, we got various ways of this. Now, we've already encountered this in terms of reference to Jesus. Jesus from Nazareth or be, Jesus von Nazareth, right? And uh, so these are the ways that Jesus would have been known as a specific particular person, right? So not Jesus Christ. That term gets applied to Jesus after his resurrection. It is not applied to Jesus prior to. All right? So that's who we're talking about. We're talking about someone who is from the village of Nazareth, someone who... Uh, worked probably in the construction trade before he began his ministry, and someone who was uh, related to Joseph and Mary, right? That's that's how they would have referred to him. Is so, it, is it rare to have the woman's name involved? I, I would I would say in standard usage, yes. I think that she's involved, in, or she it's quoted here in in the Gospels because. Mary is really the, the only uh, direct parent he has, right? Like Joseph is an adopted father, we could say, right? And so Mary has special uh, status for the Christians. So, so, but in general usage, I think they wouldn't refer to the mother unless the father was absent, was not part of the picture at all. Then they might refer to the mother, right? So... So, for example, you could go to the Old Testament and they, and they would say, uh, isn't this Naomi's daughter? Uh, you know, Naomi and Ruth, except it's daughter-in-law in that case, but because, um, because her husband has long since passed away and people there wouldn't know him. Eleanor? Yes, yeah, that's how they, that's how they, rec- they reckon it now. Yeah, but still in, yeah, yeah, in, in those days, uh, it was a very uh, patriarchal society. And so, you know, the father was really essential. You couldn't, you couldn't own property if you were a female, for example. Yeah, Miriam. Um, when I was working in Yorkton, Church of the Nazarene was very large. Yeah. They were a large congregation, and that's what made me think you said locational, Church of the Nazarene. I haven't heard of them in Regina. Uh, maybe. Yeah, there's probably a few around. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a, a large congregation. Yeah, the, the Church of the Nazarene is a, is a specific denomination, right? And Nazarene uh, does not specifically mean Nazareth, though people have acquainted the two. Uh, if you were a Nazarene in the Old Testament, like the Nazarene, would, an example of a Nazarene would be uh, Samson. Okay. So Samson. So you took certain vows, you didn't touch alcohol, you didn't cut your hair, and you were dedicated to God. That's a Nazarene. So, but what happens is because Jesus is from Nazareth, they sort of, uh, uh, Christians, especially those who didn't know, like, like uh, uh, Greek Christians or Roman Christians, who didn't necessarily know the Nazarene tradition of the Jewish people, Right, they just kind of equated those two things, and so then they would refer to Jesus as Jesus the Nazarene, and in a sense, that's accurate. That may be why, by the way, that Jesus, um, according to uh, artists throughout the centuries in Europe, uh, never uh, always had long hair, because the you know here's a person who was dedicated to God, you know, and 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 so his uncut hair would have been a um, a picture of that. The problem with that is that Jesus, we know, consumed alcohol. So that, right, because, you know, even at the Last Supper, he's sharing wine. So uh, he's not truly a Nazarene, but he is dedicated to God in a sense, right? Because he is God. Uh, All right. Well, okay, let's move on. So now we're going to talk about Christ. So who is Jesus Christ? So when we use that phrase, Christ, what are we referring to? Well, Christ was the Greek word uh, in the New Testament for the New Testament writers that they used 
for a Hebrew word, and the Hebrew word was Messiah. Now, that's the anglicization of it. I can't say the Hebrew pronunciation, but you all know uh, the word Messiah, right? Made famous, I think, uh, most famous by Handel's great oratorio, Messiah. Now we have to ask the question, what does Messiah mean then? So Messiah literally means the anointed one. So in the Hebrew scriptures, kings, priests, and prophets were anointed by pouring oil on their head. And for Christians, they came to understand Jesus as all three. He was a king, he was a priest, he was a prophet in terms of how he functioned. He was a king because he uh, ruled over all creation. He was a priest because he intercedes. Uh, He's a mediator between God and and humans. And he's a prophet because he proclaims God's word clearly with authority, right? In fact, on Sunday, you're going to hear about Jesus proclaiming God's word with authority. Um, So so for them, uh, you, you know, to have those sort of three images of king, priest, and prophet connected with Jesus made sense for the early Christians. So for them to use the word Messiah or the Greek word Christos, which is Christ, right? That kind of made sense, but there's a little more to it than that too. Many Jews in Jesus' day hoped that the former glory of Israel would be restored by a newly appointed or newly anointed, sorry, descendant of King David. And the reason why they had this in their mind is because um, uh, there are scriptures that talk about David's throne that would last forever and, and whatnot. Now, what we know, historically speaking, is that it didn't take too many more generations after David before, first of all, before the kingdom split, and then you ended up with Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Um, and then eventually, uh, the south, uh, like Judah survives uh, the attack by the, the Assyrians, uh, that Israel does not. Israel is decimated and the 10 tribes are sometimes referred to as the 10 lost tribes of Israel because they're dispersed. One of the things the Assyrians would do is they come in, take the people from that region, move them to a different region and move other people in. And that was so that people didn't have that connection to the land and would not then uh, defend their land because they were no longer on their land, so to speak. So that was a strategy that the Assyrians took. Now, the Babylonians, when they swept through a little while later, they did conquer Judah, and they took a bunch of people into exile. Exile, but not exactly slavery. Um, and, and they left a bunch of uh, people, Hebrew people, in, in that region still. So there were, there were Jews living in uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, uh, even after, um, after Babylon had conquered uh, but the sort of the, the elite, the top class, the educated people, they were the ones, the skilled people, the craftsmen, they were the ones that were taken off into Babylon um, and had to stay there and work there in Babylon. Eventually, they're allowed to come back. But what happens at that time is any sense that there has been a connection to David's throne is gone. But the people of, uh, uh, the, the Jewish people still had this hope based on this prophecy Uh, or this promise given to David, King David, that his throne would be, you know, forever, established forever. Uh, Now, uh, people saw, understood that David's kingship and maybe that of his son Solomon, that was the golden era. So if you were going to, if you were a, a Jewish person looking back on your history and you wanted to look for the golden era of your nation uh, that would have been David and Solomon. Because for one thing, that was when all 12 tribes were united. That's when they had some stability and were known as a nation. In fact, that's the first time they were known as a nation, so to speak. Uh, otherwise, they were just uh, 12 uh, tribes who were related, but they weren't necessarily seen as a, as a single unit. Um, and so, so when they look back on David, they look back on him as a king who... Uh, succeeded politically, militarily, and even spiritually because uh, David uh, worshipped God um, and wrote many psalms 
And now David was not perfect because he also had problems with like Bathsheba and stuff like that. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, he wasn't an ideal king in the sense that he didn't make mistakes. But he was one of the, certainly one of the better ones, historically speaking. And, uh, and he was sort of seen as the, um, you know, the symbol of what this nation could look like. We could be rid of all idol worship. Now imagine, at the time of Jesus, the Romans are there. They're building Roman temples, or temples to Roman gods would be a better way of putting it you know, in Jerusalem. And that's really upsetting to the Jewish people because this is, this is idol worship. This is one of the things that God, uh, in the Old Testament scriptures, God uh, constantly was, was after the people to get rid of the idols, right? So, so this person that they were looking for, this, this uh, leader who would come and restore the former glory of Israel, that person was known as the Messiah. So the Messiah, and thus Christ, came to mean the one chosen to lead now not only Israel, but the world, and thereby save it. This is how Christians came to understood it. The one chosen to lead the world and thereby save it. The one anointed, all right? Christians believe that Jesus was and is the Messiah. That is, he is the savior of all people, and the restorer of God's realm on earth. But now God's realm is not limited to a little region along the Mediterranean coast. Now God's realm is seen as being encompassing all the world and all people. And, and so what Jesus brings as, uh, as the Messiah is a much grander picture than even the Jewish people kind of anticipated in his day. All right? So... Um, now, uh, here, here's the question. Where in the Gospels do you see Jesus being anointed? There's, there's two times that, that you could refer to, but I want to see if you can pick them up. So when is Jesus kind of anointed? When he's baptized. Mm -hmm. yeah. When he's baptized. So when he's baptized, it's water being poured on his head, but, but when he's... Uh, so um, in the Old Testament... When a leader was chosen to, to lead the people for a specific purpose or whatever, uh, they were said to have been um, filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And then they were given the ability, the, the power, the wisdom, or whatever, to lead God's people for that purpose. So when, when the water is poured on Jesus, when he is baptized, then also we get something else happening, which is the Spirit descends on him, right? And, and so, so both of those things, the pouring of the water on his head and the descent of the dove on Jesus were an indication of him being God's chosen one. And in fact, then you hear a voice, according to a few of the scripture uh, pictures of this, a voice from heaven proclaim, this is my son, listen to him. So all of those are indications that he is God's chosen one. Okay. Marianne. Uh, I thought uh, right away after thinking of that, I thought of the transfiguration. Uh, I think the transfiguration, and we'll hear about that in a few weeks because that's coming up, Transfiguration Sunday. It's not an anointing so much as it is a revealing, in a sense, because there's no action, no one is doing something. But there is an interesting anointing scene close to the end of Jesus' life, and I wonder if any of you can pick it up. Yes, yeah. Uh, when Mary uh, Magdalene pours oil on Jesus' feet. And uh, that has a couple of images with it. One of them is preparation for, for burial, right? Like anointing a body with uh, perfumed oil. But there's also a hint of this is Jesus being anointed. But now watch this. The, the, the oil is poured not on his head, but on his feet because this is an indication of Jesus' um, humility, right? He humbles himself to become human, even to the point of death. And so when he's anointed, uh, he, he's anointed on his feet um, to, to indicate his, his uh, down-to-earthness, we could call it. 
I mean, these are all... Now, this is a little bit speculation because the gospel writers didn't say exactly why they intended this. But here's what you need to remember. Everything that you find in the gospels is there for a reason, a very specific reason. Um, because they're not trying to tell the whole story, because that would take too many pages, whatever. So everything that they have included is included for a very specific reason, and this could be one of them. So all of these reasons come together to uh, give us uh, the identity of Jesus as Messiah or Christ. And uh, so sometimes you will hear Jesus uh, referred to as Jesus the Christ, because that's a way of indicating this is not a last name, this is a title. Much like we might say, um, uh, Justin the Prime Minister, or um, so-and-so the Professor, or so-and-so the Doctor, or whatever, right? Like, it's a, it's a title. So that's who we're referring to. All right, any, yes, Marianne. Uh, yeah, <coughs> He washed their feet, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's, uh, any questions online here? I, I can't see you all, so if you have a question, you just have to unmute and then ask. Okay, silence, so we move on. Uh, just a little sideline here, Christ and the Kai Ro. So the Kai Ro is... Um, that's an abbreviation of Christ, and it came to be a symbol used throughout Christianity from the very early times. So what you have in the top there is you have a picture of a Cairo from the first, uh, probably the second or third century. And then at the bottom, you have a picture of a Cairo in a stained glass window that I just quite like the colors and stuff. Now, what is a Cairo? So it's made up of two letters, two Greek letters, uh, and here's the thing to remember. In the early Roman Empire, Greek was the common language, not Latin. In fact, Latin does not get to be used as the common language until the 4th, 5th centuries. Because the Romans uh, really admired what the Greeks did. And so they spoke Greek. So even uh, the great emperor Constantine... It was Greek that he spoke, not Latin. Latin was the common language of the people in, in the region of Rome, but in terms of the empire, it was Greek. And, uh, and so when, when Constantine moves the capital from Rome to what becomes Constantinople, right, uh, they continue to use Greek there. That's the language of the, uh, uh, of the upper class, of the educated, of the administration, so on and so forth. Um, and to this day, that becomes the language that is used uh, in Orthodox churches. That's why. It's because it has that connection. All right. So these are two Greek letters. And the two Greek letters are chi, which is, uh, looks to us like an X, and rho, which looks to us like a P. And so then they're combined together to create the symbol. So you can see in the top one, you can see the, the, what looks like a P and then definitely an X intersecting it. Well, you can see that in the bottom as well. Okay, so, so that is like uh, saying CHR. And so it's an abbreviation for Christ. So since uh, Jesus was being referred to as the Christ, um, that was a way to identify him. So before the cross became a symbol of Jesus, and that, that was not used, the cross as a symbol of Jesus did not get used until later Christianity. The, the symbol of Jesus in the earliest centuries was a Cairo. Now, in the Cairo at the top, there are also two other letters that are kind of there, and they're not very clear. Uh, you can see the one on the left better than the one on the right. I wonder if you can tell me what letters, Greek letters, those might be. Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega. Thank you very much. And uh, so, uh, at one point, uh, Jesus refers to himself as the Alpha and the Omega. So in the Greek alphabet, that's the A and the Z. So, the beginning and the end. So, often in a Cairo, especially in the uh, earlier versions of Cairo, you will find an Alpha and Omega placed there too. 
So it's like Christ is the beginning and the end. Okay? So on the, yeah, on the left, you can kind of see the A, and on the, on the right, you can't really see the omega, which kind of looks like a W is how it looks, the lowercase omega. Anyways, that's the symbol. So uh, if you went to Rome today, and you went down into the catacombs, uh, where the early Christians uh, would have worship services, kind of memorial services for their, their dead, uh, you will find, in many catacombs, you will find Kairos. I'm not 100% sure, but I think the one on the top there is from a catacomb. So, but they're, they're all over. All right, so that's who Christ is, or that's what Christ is. So now, uh, how are we doing for time? Okay, yeah, we're fine. Now we're going to go back to this chart. But what you need to understand is here, we're looking at that bottom triangle, the one that had the number two in it before, right? And uh, we still have at the top the words mystery and expansive, but now I've added the word, and that word is divinity. And then at the bottom, we still have the words revealed and singular, but I've added the word humanity, the timeline is still relevant, past through to future. And what you're going to see as we walk through the second article of the creed is you're going to see that in this creed that uh, the, the writers of the creed were very deliberate and very precise in portraying Jesus as fully God or fully divine and fully human. And, and so I'm going to show you this now, showing... Uh, what I want to show you is the symmetry of this and the beauty of this. Um, and, and I'm going to acknowledge, even before we uh, get going here, that when we're finished with this article, we're not actually told a lot about uh, Jesus. Like, we're not told uh, anything about his teachings or anything about his miracles or any of that stuff. Um, this is really just about the nature of Jesus, which is what the early Christians were uh, you know, trying to make clear. And so you may remember from last week, we talked about the heresies of Arianism and Gnosticism, right? Uh, Arianism saying Jesus was not fully God and uh, Gnosticism saying Jesus was not truly human. And then I indicated that unless Jesus was both fully God and fully human, he could not save us and identify with us. So now let's look at the creed and see how it portrays the two natures of Christ. And we'll start with, now I'm hoping you can see that. The, I had to make the print small for, to fit everything on here. So God's only Son, our Lord. Is that a picture of divinity or humanity? It's, uh, it's actually, I would say it's all divinity. Right, it's all divine. You're at the top of the chart, that's where the word divinity is. And, uh, I mean, people of Israel would refer to themselves as the children of God, but the, the word only is what makes Jesus unique here. God's only son, okay? And, uh, and so there's a unique relationship that Jesus has. Um, and, and then we have the phrase, our Lord. Now, the question is, what does Lord mean? Lord was a uh, political term, um, and this is what got Christians into trouble, actually, is that they used the word Lord for Jesus and, and didn't refer to the emperor as Lord. So does anyone want to guess or make a stab at what the word Lord um, might mean? Yeah, so you got ruler over all kind of idea. Um, but we would, like sometimes in the British system, they would call uh, judges lords, right? Or people who owned land would be lords. Um, the, the simplest way I've come to define lord is ultimate authority. The one who has ultimate authority. You can't go any higher than this. So in ancient times, that was the ruler. That was the king or the emperor, right? You couldn't go any higher than that. So when Paul is arrested in Jerusalem um, and they're trying to figure out what to do with him because the accusation is he's stirring up trouble, right? He appeals to the emperor, which he can do as a Roman citizen. Um, and, and then they ship him off to Rome, right? 
Now, what would be the Canadian equivalent of appealing to the emperor? That's right. So our ultimate authority is not actually a person. It's, it's the legal system. It's the law. And so the Supreme Court is our ultimate authority in Canada, right? And, uh, and so, so like, like even, well, they're kind of debating this in the States right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Does a president have full immunity? That's what they're debating. And, and what, what people are trying to say is that no, not even a president is above the law. The law is, is, the, um, ha, is the ultimate authority. So that's, that's the way we understand it. But in, in Jesus' day and uh, in the early Christian, uh, they it would have been emperors, rulers. They, so if an emperor said, uh, kill that person, that person was killed. Or if an emperor said, let that person go, that person was let go. And there was, you couldn't appeal any higher than that, right? So, so to say Jesus is Lord is to say he is the ultimate authority even above the emperor. Well, England still uses lords yeah, yeah. House of lords. Yeah, yeah. But again, I mean, I mean, uh, the, the term or, or the usage is very similar. It's referring to people who are at a status that they have authority over others right now, whether it's through the British parliamentary system or, you know, but that's essentially it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, Rome is this great empire and it's made great by our emperors. And if they, uh, you know, if we don't acknowledge their greatness and their authority over us, well, we're in trouble. Absolutely. You're, you're stirring the pot. You're just a troublemaker. And that's how Christians were understood. They were troublemakers. It still are. It still are. Uh, well, I think initially uh, he just saw like like when when Paul before he be, he was converted, I, I think Paul saw them as as disrupting the Jewish religious system that he felt very comfortable in and very secure in. Like that was his security, and now was coming you know these people who are completely messing this all up, and and that's I think so. I don't know. If, uh, he would have seen his authority in in the Jewish religion, like that's I think so. Having Jesus referred to as Lord probably would have been upsetting in that regard. Yeah, yeah. Help me understand. So the, if the president is the Lord, and the Jewish faith, that that person should be stoned to death. It was stoned to death. Uh, now, if there was a king who was in power at that time probably that could have been appealed to the king. So the priests were not above the king. But if there were no kings, right, then then the priest, the high priest, might have been the ultimate authority. So even in Jesus' execution, uh, even though the high priest, you know, agrees with the sentence that, yeah, we should execute him, they have to go to Pilate, right, to to fulfill that. Yeah. And then they mocked him with and all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like then they mocked him, saying, "Oh, sure, you're the you're the great king, you're the Messiah." Yeah, yeah. yeah. You you have to also understand that Jesus was not the only one identified as a Messiah in those years. There were others who had come along, and they said, "Oh, this guy is the Messiah." Uh, but then they uh, almost all ended either from insurrection within or execution without. All right, let's go to the next statement in the creed. Conceived by the Holy Spirit. So what words or phrases indicates divinity and what indicates humanity? Yeah, conceived to be humanity. That's a biological function. Right? That's part of our human reproduction. And uh, so conceived uh, now introduces the element of humanity into the picture. But the primary emphasis is still on divinity. Why? Because the agent of conception is not another human. 
the agent of conception is the Holy Spirit. So now we, we're starting to see a mixture. And that's what you're going to get now for the next few statements is a mixture of divinity and humanity. Right? So now the next statement, born of the Virgin Mary, what words indicate humanity? Born. And Mary. Last year. And Mary. Yeah, very good. So, so uh, now the majority of this statement is focused on Jesus' humanity, but there's still a word that indicates divinity which is virgin. So this is a unique birth. This is a birth that it does not happen by normal human means, right? And so, so there's still an element of divinity in this picture, right? But we're getting more and more humanity. Notice we're going down the chart, down to the words humanity, right? Getting more and more humanity. Now we come to the words that are uh, pictures of full humanity suffered under Pontius Pilate. So one of the things that is true about our human experience is that it it has suffering in it. Nobody escapes suffering. Some people have less suffering in their life than others, but all people have suffering of one kind or another. Now it could be physical suffering. It could be emotional suffering. Um, like there's all kinds of suffering that happens, but uh, even uh, part of our human experience is when a loved one dies, you know, we suffer grief, right? That's a very real suffering. And we all suffer that. Um, it, 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 I read this fascinating uh, article that talked about uh, humans uh, grieving pets. And that the grief of pets can actually be more intense uh, than the grief of an adult. Um, and the explanation was, was that when you're grieving an adult, especially if the person has had a terminal illness or whatnot, you've been able to sort of, you know, kind of work through it in advance a little bit and, 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 you know, kind of, uh, you know, do your final goodbyes and stuff like that. Often with the pet, you know, it's one-sided, you know, the pet just looks at you. And I experienced that, you know, when we had to put down our one dog, you know, and, and I'm in there, uh, and the vet has hooked them up, you know, and I've just, it just, you know, it's like I'm talking to the dog like I'm talking to a human, but the dog cannot talk back. You know, the dog just looks at me with those sad brown eyes and oh, that's hard. We, so that, you know, suffered. That was one of the reasons why Beth said, we're not getting another dog because I was a mess for about a week or two. And, uh, but we got another dog and I'll be a mess again at some point in the future. I just know that's just, that's part of human life. But notice the type of suffering that's indicated here is also specific. What is the specificity of this suffering? It's under Pontius Pilate. In other words, this is saying Jesus, like all the other people in that region, were under the authority of Pontius Pilate and were under the wrath of Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate could be very mean. Um, he, we, historical records outside the scriptures tell us that one of the things that Pontius Pilate did was on one occasion, he had 200 people executed, crucified, and he lined the crosses uh, along the road, uh, the main road into Jerusalem. And it was, uh, it was this way of saying to people, don't you mess with Rome. Because this is what we'll do to you. And, and the crucifixion, which is a horrific form of death, right, was meant to be a public um, uh, sign of power. And uh, it, it was meant to intimidate is really what it was. And Pilate was quite happy to use it. Now, I know in the Gospels, it kind of shows Pilate being a little bit wishy-washy with Jesus. Well, I don't see anything wrong with him. I wash my hands of this. Um, I actually, my reading of that is that Pilate was just being shrewd politician and he didn't want the blame for this leader that some people seem to really like on him. So he says, fine, you do what you want, right? And he puts the blame back on uh, the Jewish religious leaders. I take that idea. Well, and that's possible. He didn't know. 
Yeah, yeah. I think he would have had some sense if Jesus had any, like the Gospels record Jesus' big triumphal entry into Jerusalem, right? I think Pilate would have been aware of him anyways. Like, what was that big commotion last week? Oh, that was this guy, Jesus from Nazareth, Jesus Josephson, Jesus the carpenter. He's this rabbi, and people really think he's the the ultimate thing. Uh, better keep an eye on that one. So regardless, what we do know is that Pilate is the one who ultimately um, signs his, his death certificate. Says, yeah, okay, fine, do it. So um, Jesus, like everyone else in the region, is oppressed by the Romans, is a, another way of saying this, right? Like he isn't somehow above the suffering that they all, you know. Well, one of the things they suffered that they didn't like was taxation. Because they didn't like their money going back to Rome. They wanted it to stay there, right? And uh, yet Rome was famous for taxing heavily the region so they could build up the city. Yeah, Larry. Yeah, well, yeah, and yeah, and pay for the army. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so now we're going to get to the point in the in the creed where we are talking about revealed, singular, and absolutely human, and that is crucified, died, and buried. Now, the thing about this is, this is like a trifold uh, announcement of Jesus' humanity. For example, what I mean by this, if a person is crucified, they don't survive. I mean, the Romans just knew that. We're crucifying someone, that's it, they're done. But we get crucified and then died to make it the emphasis, and then finally buried. And again, you don't bury someone who isn't dead. So it's like dead, dead, and dead. Jesus is truly dead. Now, who do you think that's against? You think of heresies. Do you remember the heresies we talked about? Who would that be against? Anyone online? Of the two that I said, Arianism and Gnosticism. The Gnostics? Yes, Gnostics. Because they said Jesus wasn't truly human. He just appeared human. So he couldn't have truly died. Because he was just spirit. Spirit doesn't die. So this creed says, no, Jesus was dead, dead, and dead. He was good and dead. And to really make that point, now we're flipping over to the other side here. He descended to the dead. Now, in the old translations, we use the phrase descended into hell. And I could go into a great long explanation about what that is, but the, the the reality here is it was not talking about um, like when the original formulators of the creed were talking, they were not talking about this place of eternal punishment. They were simply referring to the place of the dead in Hebrew, Sheol. Sheol was the place of the dead. It's just where the dead went. And then they just were there and they weren't living they weren't existing, but they were in the place of the dead. It was a place of mystery, a place you didn't come back from, a place that that uh, they were just dead and gone, dead and gone. Um, the reason why descended into hell became used is there's one passage from First Peter that said, and at, when he was crucified, when he was dead, then he went and preached to the souls in captivity. And, and so the uh, idea was there, oh, maybe he was going then into hell and, and teaching them or giving them the gospel and setting them free. Uh, that was one interpretation. Another one was simply he went to the place of the dead. They were in captivity because they were in the place of the dead, and he was announcing to them that they could have new life. Uh, it, it, because it's just one phrase, it's hard to say exactly what was intended there, um, but... I think for the purpose of the creed, um, it's it's referring to his humanity. All right, now, let me explain what I mean by revealed and singular, those words at the bottom. So we've really covered the humanity part, but revealed and singular. So everyone in that era understood what crucifixion meant. 
Everyone understood what death meant. Everyone understood what suffering meant. Like these things that are at the bottom here, it's like, yeah, we understand these. We've seen these many, many times. This, this is our human experience. So, so God is being revealed or Jesus is being revealed in a common human experience, right? And we can now, we can now precisely get to a very specific point in time and place. Jesus is in Jerusalem, you know, at the time of Pontius Pilate. By the way, in those days, the way that you measured time, like they didn't have a calendar system like we have today. Uh, the calendar system that we have today, you know, which says 2023, was kind of invented by, I found out just the other day, a monk, Scythian monk, named Dionysus or Dennis. Uh, and that was in the 6th century. And uh, so how did they refer to people? They would refer to uh, a, a time by the reign of so-and-so. So like in the in the 12th year of King so-and-so's reign or so and so forth. So to say that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate was not only to name the place where he lived. So this is Judea, right? Um, it also names the time. And the crucifixion happens in a certain point in time. So there is known as like, like the three days. The three days are the pinnacle of Christianity. Ironically, in this chart, they're at the very bottom. The three days being uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So Friday when he's executed, Saturday when he's in the tomb, and Sunday when he rises. That's, that's the single point in time on which all of time hinges. So notice if you were this, uh, if this was a triangle, right? That's the hinge point. The death and resurrection of Jesus. That bottom of the triangle. That's where all of time hinges. And so the very next phrase we get is on the third day he rose again. Now, that is mostly a picture still of humanity. And I wonder if you can figure out why. I'll give you a hint. One name. Lazarus. Yeah, well, actually, in Lazarus' case, it was four days. But, but Jesus has brought others back to life. Right. And there are other stories in scriptures of people being brought back to life after been dead. Right. So there's stories in the Old Testament of Elijah bringing back someone who a, a child who had died and so forth. So like there. So there have been other humans who have been brought back to life. What is not indicated here is is this by Jesus power or God's power. So it, in other words, humans have been resurrected before and Lazarus is the best example of that because he's literally like Jesus buried in a tomb he's been in a tomb for a little while right and Jesus says roll away the stone the sisters say don't do that Jesus it's going to smell awful but he says don't do it and they do that and then he says Lazarus come forth and Lazarus comes out that's a resurrection or at least, if nothing else, it's a resuscitation. And, and I'm going to make a distinction between the two in a minute here. So, so what, what we could say here is um, there's divine action happening here. But it's not necessarily centered in Jesus, but it's happening to Jesus. But as we continue up this other side of the triangle, we will begin to see more and more that, no, this is centered in Jesus. So, all right? All right. Um, any ideas why... Uh, Jesus is in the tomb as long as he is. The number three? Uh, in one sense, yeah. Yeah, in one sense. I, I, it's quite simply to say that, yeah, he truly is dead. It's another indication that, you know, he's been absent from us for a while. Like, this is not just someone who was unconscious and then he came back. You know, he's he's been dead. Um, and And so I think that's part of it. And then there's also, uh, you know, the factor of Sabbath was in, involved there. But for early Christians, they talked about the Sunday as the eighth day. The eighth day, because you have the seventh day of, of creation, the seventh being the Sabbath, the day of rest. And then what's the next day? The eighth day. So Monday or Sunday was, was 
sometimes known as the eighth day, because why? It was the beginning of the new creation. And Jesus is the first fruit of the new creation. Which is why early Christian baptismal fonts were often eight-sided to acknowledge the eighth day, the new creation. So when you were baptized and then you uh, came out of the waters, you, like Christ, were, had been buried, and now you've been resurrected to the new life. You are a new creation. So all of that stuff is factored in here. All right, so now we get ascended into heaven. This, you would think, is, again, this has got to be full divinity. But I, I'm going to argue that, no, it's not full divinity yet. There's still an aspect of humanity. And here's the question I'm going to ask. Who ascends into heaven uh, that is human in the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. Elijah, right? Elijah, the fiery chariot comes down and takes him up into heaven, right? So, the, so what we can say is, is that Jesus isn't the only one who has been taken into heaven, right? Only human. So again, there's divine action happening here, absolutely. Uh, but there, you know, and the reason why I'm emphasizing this humanity stuff on this side is because what Christians believe it is through our connection with Jesus that we as humans have the ability for these things, resurrection and ascension. So our entrance into heaven, so to, so to speak, is made possible because of Jesus. If Jesus in his body, right, ascends into heaven, then we can see that that's possible for us too, that, that God can do that for us as well. See? And that's why, going back to where I started with the holistic understanding of human life, physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual, the, the, and we're going to get into this in the third article when we talk about resurrection of the body. Because what Christians believe about the resurrection of the body is not actually what most Christians believe. <laughs> like what the creed says. And we'll, so we'll get to that. I don't want to jump ahead too much, but, but now we're into the area of full divinity seated at the right hand of the father, but maybe one word might indicate something that is kind of human. And what is the word? What are you all doing right now? You're seated, right? So it's, it's a physical it's a physical picture, you know, someone is sitting. Now, what is this a picture of? Like, uh, what is being imagined here in terms of the setting? What is the setting? The gathering, yeah, it's even more specific than that. Ah, there, so throne. So we're talking about a throne room. Right. This is a throne room picture. All right. And you've got God, the father, right, sitting on the one throne. And then beside him is sitting Jesus. So now in the throne room, who sits beside the king or the queen or whoever? Who sits beside them? The, the crown prince or whatever. The, 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 the one to whom. That's right. The next one who's going to be. Power is going to be handed over to them, right? This is the one who power is going to be transferred to. So they're the crown prince, or in some cases, it might be the, the, the queen or whoever, right? But this is the one to whom power is going to be transferred. Now my question, let's see if you can figure this out. <laughs> uh, why the right hand? <laughs> yeah, no, no, not because he's a conservative, no. Why, why the right hand? Why does the... The crown prince or the next one in authority, why are they seated at the right hand? There you go. Thank you. So so usually the king or the ruler, the ruler has some symbol of authority. Could be a crown, could be a sword, a scepter, a ring, or whatever. And most people are right-handed. And so if you're weak and dying or whatever, what little strength you have, you can use your right hand to hand over the the scepter or the crown or whatever, or to indicate. It's like, here, okay, your turn, right? 
Yeah, yeah, left-handedness was sinister, sometimes cursed, evil. Yeah. So that's another picture here. Like you would sit on the right hand because that was the good side, so to speak. Yeah. But I, I think it's, it's the practical thing. It's no different than why are wedding bands put on the left hand? Yeah, no, it's, but it's not. It's, uh, that's the romantic version. No, it's quite simply. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's more simple than that. It's because most people are right-handed. And if you have the ring on your right hand and you're doing physical labor, it's more likely to be damaged on your right hand than on your left. It's as simple as that. Around. Yep. So yes. Unity, this is your hand, and this is your right hand. Yeah. 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 Yep. There's all those things. All you, all the stuff you didn't know and didn't want to know, but now you know it. Yeah. So that's so it's interesting that that we have these different traditions, right? Depending on where, and it'd be interesting to kind of trace back where that comes from. A lot of these things that we do by tradition, we don't actually even know where the tradition came from, right? Like, for example, the Christmas tree is supposedly connected with Martin Luther. He was the first one to connect the, this tree with Christmas. But actually, there's lots of historians who say, no, there was stuff with evergreens that was happening before. Or whatever. But nevertheless, we give it a meaning later. So, all right, but I wanted you to understand this meaning because what we don't have is we don't have throne rooms anymore. Not like this anyways, where the ultimate authority is there, right? And uh, so we need to have that understanding of what's being portrayed here. And then we get this final phrase in the second article. We'll come to judge the living and the dead. So <laughs> who has the authority to judge everyone? Only God. No human could have the authority to judge everyone. That would be impossible. But now, the other thing I want to point out here is how we understand the word judge and how it would have been understood in earlier times. So when you think of judge, okay, what do you think a judge is doing? What is, what is the judge's role? Yeah, to determine right and wrong what... What, uh, you know, someone has broken the law and, you know, are they guilty or innocent? And if they are guilty, what is the punishment, right? So when we think of judges, I think anyways, mostly because of television, uh, we think of criminal courts. But in fact, probably most of the law is happening outside of criminal courts. It's happening in civil courts where you're trying to determine what is the right um, thing to do here. So, so um, uh, what judges were expected to do was set things right, set things right, to to function with justice, to make sure justice happens. So, an example of this from the Old Testament, where a king is functioning as a judge in this sense, is the story of Solomon, whose two women are brought before Solomon. And they both claim that this child, this infant, is theirs. Um, they had both given birth to, to children. The one uh, woman's uh, uh, child died, I think, because she rolled on the child and the child suffocated or whatever. And then she took the other woman's child and claimed it as her own. And so now both women are saying, that child is mine. And so it's brought before Solomon. Now, there's no crime here, but there is a problem to be solved. There is a situation that needs to be set right. Who is the real mother? Who should raise this child? So Solomon, in his wisdom, says famously, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to cut the baby in half and give a half to each woman. And the real mother cries out and says, no, no, don't do that. Let the baby live, uh, even if it has to go to this woman. And Solomon says, there's the real mother. Right. So Solomon uses his understanding of human psychology, I would say, to determine what is the right solution what sets things right so when it talks about jesus coming to judge um we are mistaken if we think that the primary purpose of that is to determine innocence or guilt because a lot of people kind of think of oh jesus as judge as a negative image 
But for Christians, Jesus as judge was actually a positive image. The reason why we think of it as a negative image, because we think, oh, he's going to determine that we're guilty and we should be punished. Because all of us know that we're not perfect, that we've made mistakes. Yeah, we're going to be sent to the principal's office or worse, right, or whatever, right? But for the early Christians, their understanding of judgment is one who's going to set things right, who's going to bring justice into the picture, who's going to be able to sort things out. And the only one who is able to sort things out fully and completely is God. Because humans cannot even understand the motivations of others half the time. In fact, that not that one of the first questions we ask when there's been like um, a shooter who's, uh, you know, like a tragedy where someone is killed, a lot of other people, we ask the question, how come they did this? What was their motivation? Because we're curious about that. We can't figure it out. Why would someone ever do anything like this, right? And uh, and sometimes, you know, we get it totally wrong too. And people are accused of being guilty of something. And then later on, we find out, no, they were actually innocent. You know, DNA evidence is now overturned a number of convictions. Those are all examples of our human um our human ability to judge is limited. Like we, like we cannot do it completely and, 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 and accurately, but God can. Because what the scriptures tell us, that God knows the very thoughts of our heart, right? God knows what our motivations are. God knows what our intentions are and so on and so forth. So if God is going to, if anyone's going to set things right, it's going to be God. So this is a picture of, of full divinity but in a positive sense. And I wanted to make that clear rather than a negative sense. So Christians look forward to the time when God was going to set things right. Because what was one of the things that was going to happen? Well, God would end this persecution for one thing. Right? Because they're being persecuted by Rome for the first three centuries. Um, you know, just because of their faith in Christ. Well, God is going to stop that. That would be an example of uh, bringing justice into the scene. So they anticipated this with, with uh, joy. They anticipated the judgment with joy, which is, again, that seems to be contrary to the way that we've kind of been raised. And even the way that Christianity has kind of been taught in North America for the last couple of centuries, which really was you want to avoid the judgment of hell and damnation. Right. That that was sort of the way that was the way you motivated people to believe in Christ. You scared the hell out of them. Right. Literally. So now, which is not to say that there is an element of that, too. But um, but there is, I wanted to point out that the element of judging that's here is has more to do with setting things right, with, with bringing true justice to all the world. That's really what's being done here. All right, now we've got one more thing to do on this chart. And that is, I want to show you how beautifully constructed this chart is, because even within this chart, even within the second article, you have uh, acknowledgments and a way of tying this, this article together with the first article and the third article. So the first thing we'll see is this phrase, seated at the right hand of the Father, ties us to the first article about God the Father, creator of heaven and earth, right? So we get that tie-in. But likewise, you also have this phrase, conceived by the Holy Spirit, which ties us to the third person of the Trinity. So this beautifully constructed um, uh, article gives us a picture of Jesus' full divinity, full humanity, and Jesus' connection with the whole Trinity. Everything is done in a succinct, precise pattern. <coughs> All right. Woo! How you doing? It's a lot of stuff there. So again, I want to emphasize that the reason why this was important for the early Christians was because there were those who said Jesus was not truly God or Jesus was not truly human. And so then they wanted to make sure that this was the case. Now, we can also uh, ask questions of Jesus' humanity and divinity just by looking at scriptures. So that's where we're going to turn next. So gospel stories reveal both natures of Jesus Christ. So we're going to look at um, four gospel stories. And um, 
How are we doing for time? Yeah, we got 10 minutes. All right. So um, what I'm going to ask you to do is look up the story and probably skim through it in some cases because they're longer. But you'll recognize most of these stories. So Luke 2, 1 to 21. And then I want you to identify what indicates humanity and what indicates divinity in these stories. I mean, you should, you should all recognize this is the Christmas story, right? Okay. So uh, what parts of the story indicate Jesus' humanity? Jesus' humanity. His birth, he's born. He's a vulnerable baby, right? He's born like all humans are born. We all have birthdays. Jesus has a birthday. And uh, that's one indication. But I think there's a few others in the story, actually starting with the very first verse. What's the indication that Jesus is human? There, I'll, I'll give you the parallel line in the creed, suffered under Pontius Pilate. What's the line here? Caesar Augustus orders a, 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 a census, and that requires you know, Mary to travel with Joseph to Bethlehem, right? Jesus has no say in that, right? He's just along for the ride. He can't say, oh, it doesn't matter. I, it, I don't want to go be born in a stable. Uh, no, can't say that. Yeah. Yeah, and there's another one that traces him back to Adam. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're they're writing scripture here. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, go to Matthew. Matthew, the first chapter is is Jesus' genealogy, and that traces him back to Abraham, right? And then, um, oh, where's the one that traces him back to Adam? I wanted to say it's in Luke, but I'm not sure it is. The most famous one is the one in Matthew. Oh, there it is. It is in Luke. Okay. So if you go to Luke chapter uh, 3, you get the genealogy of Jesus going back to, this is the end of chapter 3, genealogy of, of Jesus going back to Adam. Yeah. Yeah. So what we've got here, uh, oh, these are the four. Okay. What we've got is in Luke, uh, his birth is an indication of his humanity. But what in the story might indicate his divinity? The, the angels. There you go. So you got the angels. The angels show up and they're singing praise about this event, right? So, so that doesn't happen when humans are born, typically, right? You might, uh, for the birth of a of a royal, you might have a bunch of people celebrating, right? Like, uh, like you think of the celebrations when a prince. Harry, was it Harry? Anyways, the first one born to um, William. William, William. Yeah, you know, people were cheering and stuff, but no angels. That was just people, right? No angels. So that's the, the, that story has elements of both in it. Definitely human stuff, right? And and a little bit of sense that oh, this this Jesus is unique, and uh, it has a, a divinity, a divine aspect about him. All right, let's go to uh, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 
my son, your sins are forgiven. Only God can forgive sins. Okay, so um, so a few things. Okay, we can talk about uh, the human part of it. Is that Jesus is is uh, crowded in, like 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 he's got people crowded around him, and he's functioning very much with his human body. Um, and uh, so there's not even any space near the door. Like I mean, like the, he's crowded. He's hemmed in. So now, even if you wanted to help someone else, uh, he can't get to him. So that's a like a human characteristic, right? Like he's he's just he's uh, he's in a mob. He's in the middle of a mob, so to speak. So then you get this lowering down of the man through the roof, but then the divine picture comes in the healing and the announcement of forgiveness. Right. So first of all, he announces forget forgiveness, and people say, "Who could forgive but God?" And he says, "Well, which is easier to say?" Get up and walk, or your sin is forgiven. So get up and walk. And then the people go, oh, we're dealing with someone here who's maybe a little more than what we thought he was. We thought he was this powerful teacher, but he's more than that. He's forgiving sins. What is that all about? The 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 healing is not so much of a, uh, other than the, the fact that the healing was pretty dramatic. Like, here's a, here's a paralyzed man. It's like there were healers in Jesus' day, but they would heal probably things that were less severe than that. You know, like they would heal uh, illnesses um, and so on and so forth. But uh, and they would usually do so with herbs and medicine. Like they were healers around. Um, Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. So Jesus is doing this, by the way. He does the healing as a uh, not as a way of of intimidating people or whatever, but saying you can trust my words. You can trust my teachings because I have the authority to do this. I because I can I have the authority to say. Get up and take your bed and walk. So today. We. We go to church and we pray for forgiveness. Yep. Or we go through confession. And this is my ignorance speaking here. Does a priest forgive sins? What a priest does, or what a priest should understand themselves as doing, is announcing forgiveness on behalf of Christ. The priest does not have the power to forgive sins, except that there is some interpretation. Like, I mean, Jesus says to Peter at one point, you know, I give to you the keys of the kingdom. Those who you forgive will be forgiven. But like, there's a sense of that. But like what we say in our Lutheran liturgy is as a called and ordained minister of the church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the forgiveness of your sins. Right. Um, and uh, so so the way that that like it, what I can tell you, too, is that in the Roman Catholic tradition, uh, the practice of private confession is is dissipating it's disappearing um i think that now you want to know where that practice came from it came from the celtic christians because in the sixth century sixth and seventh century when a person um uh announced their sins uh and then were granted forgiveness they had to do so publicly in front of the whole congregation they brought went up to the congregation and they had to say i have sinned this is what i did blah 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 and then the priest would then say, acknowledge, okay, well, you've confessed your sin and uh, you, God forgives you, right? But they had to make that public. So the Celtic church actually changed that and said, no, we're, gonna, we're, not, we're not about embarrassing people here, but we are about trying to help people move past their mistakes and understand that, that there is consequence, blah, blah, blah. So then that's where private confession came in, but then it became something different. So, all right. And at what age of this? Spectrum of adulthood, from childhood adulthood, does that happen? Well, theoretically, it could happen at any age. But the understanding, like some faith, oh, yeah, people until they're 10 years of age, but you yeah. know the difference between right and wrong. Yeah, but I would say I, I don't think we really understand the full meaning of baptism or communion ever. We, we can get deeper understanding, but I don't think we'll ever have a full understanding because of the mystery of it. That's the whole nature of it. I think that we put too much emphasis on uh, 
uh, on saying that my understanding is what makes forgiveness possible. My understanding is what makes the sacrament possible. It's not my understanding. It's God's work and my acceptance of that work. So can a child accept the gifts of God without fully understanding them? Absolutely. Because adults have to do the same. They have to accept the gifts of God, including forgiveness, even without fully understanding it, if that kind of makes sense. So this idea of understanding being the key, um, uh, that really was a kind of a post-enlightenment mentality. Yeah. Yeah, Marianne and then Ray. My Catholic neighbor she debates that with me, the truth. Then if she went, anyway, she's left the church. She went to her priest and said, when Christ, the instant Christ died, the curtain was torn to shreds. We don't need, that's the indication that we can come directly to God. Yeah. We don't have Whenever yeah. we feel at any time of day, we don't have to go through the Yeah, which is why the, the word Christ or Messiah is applied to the anointed one, is applied to Jesus, because he is like our priest. He makes it possible to come to God directly. Great. I think the early Christians, in what group was that? Catholic Which- Celtics. The Celtics, the Celtic Christians. So, so when Christ, when when Patrick brought Christianity to Ireland, because it was way off in the North Sea, it was not influenced as much by the version of Christianity that that was on the European continent. So it developed a little bit different flavor of Christianity that was gentler, more tied to nature, and in some ways, I think, more reminiscent of the early Christian uh, church, like in the first couple of centuries. They were just, we just referred to them as the Celtic Christians. No, they weren't there. This was, this is sixth, seventh, and eighth centuries. And then what happens in the ninth century is that uh, the, the version of Christianity that is dominant on the continent begins to impose its will on the Celtic Christians and changes some of the stuff. So that by the time you get to the 10th century, Christianity in Ireland looks the same as Christianity in France or Gaul. You guys are getting me off track here, but that's all right. Where are we doing for time? Well, I'm going to go through these last ones real quick. Okay, John 4 uh, to 26 is the story of Jesus and the woman at the well in Samaria. So uh, the story goes, I'm just going to tell it to you, right? The story goes, Jesus arrives at this village, and uh, he's in the region of Samaria. The disciples go into the village to buy supplies. Jesus is left alone at the well. There's also a woman there in the middle of the day. She's drawing water, and Jesus has a conversation with her. And he begins by saying, can you get me a drink? And then that starts a conversation. And in the end of the conversation, the woman says, could he be the Messiah? And, uh, and uh, it's a, you know, he reveals to her, he knows all about her. Well, you're right to say you have no husband because you've had four husbands, and the person you're with now isn't your husband, and, and so on and so forth. Like, it's that story. So the, his thirst and his tiredness, he's sitting at the well, he's thirsty, he's tired. That's an indication of his humanity, right? And his conversation with this woman is a very human conversation, except for the divine knowledge that Jesus has, right? So he has this knowledge that he shouldn't have about the woman. He shouldn't know that she's had four husbands. I mean, he's a stranger in that region, and yet he knows this stuff. And, uh, and that makes all the difference. Uh, in the story. So that's the story of, um, of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. So you get pictures both of humanity and divinity. And then finally, uh, Matthew 27, 45 to 54. This is the crucifixion of Jesus in Matthew's version. And obviously his death is a very uh, 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 in-your-face picture of Jesus' humanity. You know, And his death is described in, in great detail there. Uh, but there is aspects of, of, of divinity shown in that, and that is the unnatural consequences that happen. So, Marianne, you talked about the curtain being ripped. That's Matthew's gospel. The curtain is torn. There's an earthquake. And a centurion who's standing there says, surely this is God's son. So, so all of those are sort of acknowledgments of Jesus' divinity, even within his death. 
So um, uh, what I'm trying to show you here is that what we have in the creed showing both natures of Jesus is also shown in the gospel. Like they're trying to show the same thing. Jesus was fully God and fully human. All right. So that brings us to an end. Uh, we're, we started five minutes late, so we're now right on time. But uh, I do want to give a chance for any questions from anybody out there. First of all, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this so I can see you. There we go. Any questions from anybody out there or comments? Brenda? Yeah, I just need to unmute. Um, one thing that is confusing to me is that when in Matthew, when they, he goes through the genealogy, he goes through Joseph. Yeah. But really, Joseph didn't have anything to do with Jesus' birth. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we... We, we talked about the genealogy in in, in, um, in Luke, and the genealogy in Luke uh, is different, the different names and whatnot. I mean, what the gospel writers were doing is they were simply using what the people at the time would understand uh, as an appropriate way to connect Jesus to the history of Israel. And so they were using the genealogy in that way. And so it was a patriarchal genealogy for that reason. Right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. But you're right. But but so was, did Mary have the same inherited lineage as well, Joseph? Uh, 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 it, because of her connection with Joseph, that would be how they would do that. Because oh, okay. she's now connected with Joseph and, 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 and whatnot. I don't understand the full intricacies of uh, the genealogy stuff. But of, what I can say is that even within these genealogies, there's hiccups. Like you have Ruth mentioned. Ruth yeah. isn't even Jewish. Yeah. Right. So, so I mean, there's interesting, like yeah. the genealogies, I think we need to see them less as an accurate account of, of Jesus' origins and more as a way of tying Jesus into the story of the people of Israel, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any questions in, in the room here? So, so uh, the uh, the interesting thing that I've seen, I've been in ministry long enough to see this shift. When I first started, uh, women almost always took the man's name, and then kind of in the middle years, uh, there was a shift, and people were either hyphenating names or not taking the man's name. And now in the last about five years, it's gone back to women taking the man's name. You just see these, it's just cultural shifts that's happening. And yeah. Oh yeah. And, and different cultures have different ways of incorporating both sides. And, and I think there's value in that. Like I've seen people who have used the, their mother's side name as their middle name. Make his voice up, or something. And it's Mrs. Herman, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. And Mr. Herman Clay's been dead for 30 years, but she never got her name on there. She's still Mrs. Herman Clay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean these, these, are, these are cultural, like that's the thing we have to realize. These are all cultural practices, but they do show us something about attitudes at different times and in, in, in stages. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but why uh, it bothers me is so, uh, I was involved with my W quite a bit uh, in Regina, and they have the big pack of the women that form the foundation. And it was yeah. Mrs. Herman Smith and yeah, yeah. Mrs. Yeah. Smith, David yeah. Sultans. They never have. We're, we're getting into a discussion here on women taking men's names when they're married, which has nothing to do with our study, really, but it's an interesting thing. But I think we should wrap up if there's no more uh, questions about the content for today. Where we're going to go uh, next week is we're going to go into the third article, which is the article about the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see what that has to say. Uh, and I'm going to try and give you new insights into some of the statements that you have in the third article. Um, and uh, that's where we're heading next week. So let's end with a prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that you came to us as Jesus, fully human, fully divine.
that we might identify with you and understand that you you identify with our life and our situations, our struggles and our joys. And we thank you that you are also our savior and that you offer us an entrance into your realm, your eternal realm, where we can celebrate with you and all the faithful throughout eternity. We ask that you would uh, keep everyone uh, in this study safe and in good health, and that uh, you would inspire us through the week to be followers of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Yeah, it's a wrap. <laughs>